Uh, okay, so I'm just going to pick up where we left off. Okay, we're going to talk about the process of DNA replication. And uh, these enzymes are uh, critical. Okay, so we're going to go through this. This first picture is a big, complicated overview. Okay, and I'm not going to go into all the details at this exact moment. Okay, because there's a lot going on right here. I'll just point out a few things. Okay, here's that helicase down here. Here's the single-stranded binding proteins. Uh, here's primase. POL3 stands for polymerase. So here's the enzyme DNA polymerase 3. Here's DNA ligase. Okay, I guess I should, maybe I'll just say uh, helicase unwinds these strands. So the DNA is double-stranded. The job of helicase is to unwind it and open it up so that the copying machinery can get in there. Uh, these single-stranded binding proteins stabilize that single strand once helicase opens it. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Primase is actually an enzyme that starts the process of copying. Uh, and this primer is a little short piece of DNA that binds first, and then the primase makes the primer, starts making the whole copy. Okay. Uh, let's see here, DNA ligase, we'll get to that one, and we're going to go through this process, okay? So this animation is also helpful. All right, so here's helicase, okay? It unwinds the double strand, and then these single-stranded binding proteins come along and stable it, stabilize it, okay? Because previously it had been held together by only hydrogen bonds, remember, um, right? AT had two hydrogen bonds, the AT base pair. And the GC base pairs had three hydrogen bonds, but those had to get broken in order for this double strand to get open. And that is what helicase does. Okay, and then sort of, I'll call this downstream, topoisomerase enzyme is there because now if you have something that's twisted and you start to untwist it, uh, that puts tension down, further down the chain of whatever you're untwisting. And so then topoisomerase comes along and actually relieves some of that tension. Okay, it kind of breaks some hydrogen bonds, reforms them, and kind of keeps the whole thing held together. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's here, topoisomerase. So this is like the garden hose. I finally went and bought those other ones that are soft, but they're expensive <clears throat> and they're not very durable. Okay, but I don't get this kind of knot, all right? But topoisomerase is helpful for untangling uh, those over tensioned coils that happen when helicase unwinds those strands. Uh, okay, so this is just a picture showing sort of a partially unwound double helix with these bases showing here and the beauty of this whole entire thing, which, you know, kind of blows my mind um, every time I think about it, is that this strand, right, tells the other strand what they need, right? Because of this, the base pairing rules, okay? So this new strand here, we have an A, a C, a G, and a G, right? And this new strand that gets put here would have a T, a G, a C, a C, and an A. Okay, so it's really very amazing, if you ask me. All right, so uh, here's primase now. Okay, helicase has started the unwinding. Topoisomerase is relieving some of the tension. Okay, primase is needed because DNA polymerase cannot start by itself. It's unable to do that. So we actually have to have a short little, what's called a primer made out of RNA instead of DNA. Okay, so it's kind of like priming the pumps, getting it started. Okay, we get a short little piece of RNA right here that's made by this primase enzyme. And then DNA polymerase can come along okay, and add the nucleotide. So got to have this little piece of RNA to get the whole thing started. And you're going to need that on both strands. All right. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier. The whole method by which new strands get added is, once again, our very favorite dehydration synthesis reaction. Okay. And I'm going to talk again here in a second about this directionality situation. Okay. Because here's... Here's a piece of double-stranded DNA. Here's the five prime end of this strand. And then here's its three prime end. And remember they're anti-parallel. So the other strand 
The complementary strand runs in the other direction. Five prime is on the bottom, three prime is on the top. Okay, and this free three prime end has this OH group on it, which is required if you're going to do dehydration synthesis. So because the OH is on this three prime end, the three prime end is where new nucleotides get added through the process of dehydration synthesis. Okay, so I want to talk about this for a second on my camera. All right, so I just wanted to explain this numbering a little bit and this whole directionality thing. So this is a picture of three nucleotides. Here's the first one, here's the second one, and here's the third one. Remember, every nucleotide has a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and a phosphate group. So what's going on here? Here, I'll just circle those. Here's one, here's the other one, and here's the other one. And these things have a numbering system. So on these sugars, ribose has a five carbon sugar. That's a carbon, 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 carbon. That's our ribose. This is carbon number one prime. That's called two prime. That's carbon three prime. That's four prime and that's five prime. So when we call these strands three prime to five prime, it's because this OH group is on the three prime carbon. Okay, the new nucleotide gets added right here, new deoxynucleotide. Um, and then up here on the five prime end, we have a free phosphate. So this is a five prime end. Okay, because this carbon right there is carbon number five prime. This is the three prime end because that carbon is numbered carbon three prime. Okay, and this sugar is deoxyribose because on carbon number two, we have an H right there instead of an OH. So there's also a sugar called just ribose. Okay, this is deoxyribose. So anyway, here's the directionality with this free OH down here on the three prime end, and the phosphate group is on the five prime end. So this goes five prime to three prime, okay? And when we start drawing out these replication forks, I would strongly suggest that you number your ends like that, but we'll do that in a second. Okay, so moving on, uh, this is just that same picture again. Here's that three prime carbon with the OH on it. Okay, so that new nucleotide gets added to that three prime end. All right, so this in yellow is the really critical part. New strands are always made in the five prime to three prime direction. So from five prime to three prime, because new nucleotides are always added to that three prime end, okay, because of that OH. All right, so let's talk about DNA polymerase. This is now the enzyme that's gonna actually add new nucleotides to the growing strand, okay, and they're gonna use the other strand as a template. So the complementary uh, nucleotide will come in, and base pairing will happen. Okay, and that all is done by DNA polymerase three. There's more than one polymerase. All right, and it can't add, it can't do this by itself. It can't start the process, right? We need that RNA primase to do that. It can only add nucleotides to an already growing strand. So that's what DNA polymerase does. Okay, and then here's the whole directionality thing, which I really want to do on a piece of paper because uh, it can get confusing. So I'm going to switch back to my camera. All right, I'm going to draw out what's going to be coming up on the slides, but I'm just going to explain it first with my pen. So let's start out with a double-stranded piece of DNA. I'm going to label my strands. Oops, can't see that, sorry. That's the five prime end, that's the three prime end, and so forth. Okay, so we're going to try to replicate that. So we'll get a replication bubble that gets made here. I'm going to continue to label my ends because, right, they can only grow in the five prime to three prime direction. So here's my replication fork, right? So in reality, you know, replication can start from this fork and go this way. The color's a little faint. Or, and it can start from this fork and go this way. Okay, so we really have to keep track of our ends, okay, of our DNA. So let's just go down and do some replication at this fork for the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna go like this. So our direction of replication is, in this case, we're gonna go left. Direction of replication. 
Okay, and I'm leading up to the whole leg, leading strand, lagging strand situation. So if I redraw this and I open up that fork like that, five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, okay, this strand right here is going to get copied right in the five prime to three prime direction continuously okay because as this fork opens up more i'm going to redraw it now with that opening further back okay this strand oops let me label these five prime three prime five prime three prime this strand can just continue to grow so as that fork opens this strand can just keep on adding nucleotides continuously to that three prime end. So this is called the leading strand. Leading strand, okay? Uh, nucleotides are added continuously. All right, and this is all on the slides, and I don't know if I spelled that right, okay? The other strand still can only go in the five prime to three prime direction. So if I get a piece like this getting going here, oops, uh, five, this is three prime, this is five prime. So it has to go like this, right? Oops, my bad, this way, right? Five prime to three prime, right? It starts right there, but now the fork is open. So I've got this little piece here, five prime to three prime, and I need to keep making a new piece like that. Okay, so I have to get these separate little pieces. Okay, this is called the lagging strand. Okay, and those little pieces are not made in a continuous manner because, again, if I open this fork up even more, right, now I've got this piece, this piece, and this piece all uh, continuing to get added on the leading strand. That can just keep on happening. Okay, so the thing with the labeling of the ends is you've got to keep track, right, of which end is which so that you know which is your lagging strand and which is your leading strand. Because on the other fork, right, we got the opposite situation. Okay, if I go like this now, if I redraw just that fork, three prime to five prime, five prime to three prime. This one is gonna get made continuously. So this is gonna be the leading strand. All right, and this one is gonna get made discontinuously. So that's gonna be the lagging strand. Okay, so you just got to keep track of your ends. All right, so let's go through this again now with these slides. Okay, so here's the situation. Okay, we got this replication fork. It's opening up. Uh, RNA primer starts to bind and starts to make it able for polymerase to get on here. This strand can just go continuously in the five prime to three prime direction. So that is called the leading strand. That's shown here with that fork opened up farther. Uh, the other strand, right, in this picture, if we're doing this left-hand fork, it's the bottom one, okay? Those pieces have to get added, you know, little by little, okay? So primase is going to make multiple primers. Um, sorry, I'm supposedly helping, I think, with Science Bowl today, but I'm waiting for a message from Mr. Roddy. Anyway, uh, on the lagging strand, those new pieces are made discontinuously, right? Because the fork opens up little by little, and as more of the fork opens, a new little chunk can get made. All right, so primase is going to make multiple primers. Okay, these new strands are always going to grow in the five prime to three prime direction. So if you label your strands, you shouldn't get too mixed up. Uh, those little pieces are called Okazaki fragments. Okay, so those little chunks that get made along the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. And the spaces between those chunks get sealed up with DNA ligase. So this is where ligase comes into play. Okay, it makes a covalent bond to connect these fragments. So this is the first fragment. Here's our new primer. The second fragment. Here's our primer. Okay, then ligase will come along and make it into one continuous strand. So I would encourage you to draw this out on your paper and just make sure you've got these ends straight and that this makes sense to you in your head. Okay, uh, you can watch that animation if you want to. And here's just another picture of the lagging strand replication. All right, so proofreading, I'm going to keep going even though we're at about 15 minutes right now. Okay, errors can get made. During replication, okay, one type of error is called a mutation. 
Okay, and we get lots of mutations all the time, and this is actually a big source of genetic diversity. And when we talk about evolution, uh, you will see that this is a big mechanism by which evolution and natural selection happen. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, so that would be an error made during DNA replication. You can also get errors after replication, you know, too much UV sunlight, different chemicals, and so on. All right, um, there are ways that polymerase can fix these mistakes. The first way is called mismatch repair. Okay, so here's our wrong base. Okay, there are other enzymes that can come along and cut that out, remove it, and then they take out a bigger chunk so that there's actually enough room for the new polymerase to come in. They'd use this existing strand as a template again, and they would make a repaired strand. Okay, so that is pretty awesome. That is called mismatch repair. Okay, it, in, it replaces, you know, the incorrect nucleotides. All right, excision repair is when an entire chunk is cut out by an enzyme called a nuclease. So remember, ASC is an enzyme. Nuclease is an enzyme that will cut out the nucleotides. Okay, so that'll cut out the damaged section and use a whole another bunch of enzymes to replace it again using this other strand as a template, and then lead, DNA ligase will seal it up again. Okay, that is called excision repair. Uh, okay, and then this is just a slide making you, asking you to think about the cell cycle. So for example, if the cells are not replicating properly, you know, you've got some error, where in the cell cycle is that gonna get detected? Okay, so here's where the S phase is. DNA synthesis is happening in the S phase. So most likely that G2 checkpoint is where that's gonna get caught. If there's an error in replication during the S phase, this checkpoint hopefully would catch it and then send it back for repair. Okay, so I believe that's it. Uh, and I will put the link for that awesome, most beautiful experiment video onto the slides. Have a great day.